Good afternoon. My name is Kent Wong. I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our class on nonviolence and social movements with Reverend James Lawson, Jr. This is a class that has been offered at UCLA for the past 20 years. We are currently on week five and it will be broadcast every Wednesday throughout the country for those of you who would like to join us. We are very privileged today to have with us Professor Angeline Butler from John Jay Criminal Justice College in New York. She was one of the participants in the historic Nashville sit-in campaign that changed the course of US history. And we will be having a conversation with Reverend James Lawson Jr., who was a mentor and um, advisor to so many during the course of that, came, that campaign and in the subsequent years following. So uh, to begin today's uh, program and class on the Nashville sit-in campaign, I wanted to share with you some photographs from that uh, historic event, uh, which will help provide uh, some context and some visual reinforcement of what occurred back in 1960, over 60 years ago. So um, uh, um, Chris, if you could allow me to do with a share screen, then I will um, uh, start with a very brief slideshow and then we'll start the conversation between Reverend Lawson and Professor Butler. So um, um, give me one second to set it up. So this is a photo that uh, was taken of the Nashville sit-in movement back in 1960, which we will be addressing in today's conversation. This was a peaceful, nonviolent protest aimed at challenging the Jim Crow policies and the policies of racial segregation that were prevalent throughout Nashville, throughout Tennessee, and throughout the South, as well as other parts of the country. And so this was a protest that had been planned for months and months. There was a series of nonviolent workshops that Reverend Lawson led that engaged many community and student leaders in learning about the philosophy of nonviolence and in uh, using their collective wisdom, strength, and energy to challenge the segregationist policies uh, in Nashville. And although they were a nonviolent group of protesters, inevitably they were met with violence. In this slide, you see the way some of the peaceful protesters had drinks uh, poured over their heads and uh, thrown in their faces. Uh, some had lit cigarettes put out in their hair. Some were physically assaulted by white mobs who would gather and heckle and to uh, challenge and to confront, physically beat and throw to the ground some of the peaceful protesters as many police stood by and watched. Then when the police finally did intervene after the white mobs had beaten and attacked the peaceful protesters, it wasn't the white mobs that were arrested. Indeed, it was the peaceful protesters. One of the student leaders that emerged was John Lewis. And this is a photo of John Lewis being arrested for his participation in the Nashville sit-in campaign. 
And here is the mugshot of John Lewis getting arrested as part of the Nashville campaign. I think it is very appropriate that we honor the spirit, the courage, and the tremendous leadership of John Lewis, who went on to serve for many years in Congress and who taught us all the importance of good trouble. Here is a picture of Reverend Lawson addressing a large community gathering during the course of the Nashville sit-in campaign. And week after week, as the campaign continued, the mobilization from the community also continued. And as more peaceful protesters were jailed, the community rallied around those who, that were thrown in jail. Here's a, another photo of Reverend Lawson uh, addressing one of many community forums, community workshops, and meetings during the course of the Nashville campaign. And ultimately, there was a meeting held with the mayor of Nashville, where some of the leaders of the sit-in campaign, including Diane Nash, challenged uh, publicly in front of uh, TV cameras and journalists. Uh, and uh, this was a turning point in terms of the uh, successful desegregation of the um, uh, lunch counters in um, Nashville. This is um, Angeline Butler, who um, uh, appeared on the cover of Jet Magazine. The caption read, sit in to showbiz, because <laughs> Professor Butler was not only a, uh, uh, a uh, activist, a, a leader, uh, someone who participated in the sit-in movement, who helped to build the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who participated in the Freedom Rides, uh, but she is also a talented uh, performer and musician. And so uh, uh, from sit-in to showbiz was the caption. And here is a more recent um, photo of both uh, uh, Professor Butler as well as a historic photo of um, Angeline Butler uh, in the front lines of the struggle in um, uh, Nashville. And uh, uh, the caption reads, Angeline Butler is a musician, teacher, and activist who became active in the civil rights movement in 1961, one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who worked with Dr. King until his murder in 1968. During the civil rights era, Angeline Butler, now John Jay College Professor of Criminal Justice, participated in sit-ins and demonstrations staged by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, including freedom rides that traveled throughout the South. So we are very pleased to be joined by Professor Angeline Butler. Uh, and I'm going to start off the question, however, to Reverend Lawson, because last week we talked about the historic Montgomery bus boycott as the very first test case in building a successful nonviolent campaign that changed the course of US history. And in many ways, Nashville was the second. So could you tell me how the decision was made to focus on Nashville and the desegregation of downtown? Yes, uh, again, welcome, Angeline. Uh, good to see you. Again, of course, you and I have stayed in contact across since Nashville by phone and by your coming out here for different things and, and all. So, but it's good to see you again and good to have you. And I want to also sim simply mention the fact that Angeline is one of the people out of the 1960 campaigns who has continued to push the struggle for justice and the nonviolent struggle for beauty and truth and the advancement of every dimension of uh, black people and all people for a different, a beloved community. And uh, that's very, very important. She's one of the handful of people continue to be activists across our land. So we welcome you, Angela. Um, all right, 
to, to the uh, visitors as well as to the class, remember now that this is a part of the continuing development of what the late Congressman John Lewis called the nonviolent movement of America. We must tell our own story <laughs> and not allow conventional observers, media, journalists, academics to tell the story for us. And that's one of the tasks that I have in my own life. So this is um, the Nashville story, the second major campaign of the nonviolent movement of America, 1953 to 1973. In each of those years, there were major events that built the movement and caused the movement to emerge. And then there were hundreds and thousands of secondary movements around the country. Few of them have been studied. <laughs> and there were concrete results of the campaign. Now, uh, I wanted understood that the nonviolent movement of America was the nuclear engine of the civil rights movement of the 20th century. That's the language I use, the nuclear engine. I, I want uh, people to see the civil rights movement as the umbrella omnibus movement that must include the wonderful story of the Little Rock Nine, 1957, 1960, the, the horrendous uh, preparation in the black community that was caused by the desegregation of baseball in 1947, and a whole reign of other things that took place. Uh, I said the first week of the class that the humongous NAACP uh, work and strategy that produced the May 17th, 1954 decision that constitutionally ra racism and segregation are unconstitutional is the part of one of the two events that begins this nonviolent movement of, of action because going to the court is a nonviolent tactic for bringing about social, political, economic, religious change. So I, 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 uh, in, in my teaching and writing of the last 20, 30, 40, 60 years, I have been pushing for the media and the academy to get this story right and to use proper language. Uh, so I call it the nuclear engine which caused the massive awakening for the nonviolent movement. Now, how did it come about? Well, the first major nonviolent campaign of direct action was obviously the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and after that, or during that boycott, and after that boycott, uh, uh, people all over the world were excited about what was happening. I saw this in India and I saw it in Africa in 56. And um, uh, I was excited because I had expected this movement to take place. Um, so the Montgomery bus boycott was uh, uh, 1955, 57 in the uh, first sit-in campaign was second. As I traveled around the South, as the Southern Secretary for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, <laughs> under which we, uh, uh, under which I worked, was able to work across the South, many of the places in the South. One of the things that people like Matthew McCollum, <laughs> a pastor in South Carolina, uh, people like um, Arthur Harvey, a labor union man in Louisiana, people like um, uh, Charles Walker, a doctor in, Los, in uh, Nashville, 
one of the things this group of people who were instantly supportive of the Montgomery bus boycott, one of the major issues for them across the Southeast especially was, can it happen again? And where would it happen again? My work coming in as, as a FOR man, um, after 10 years of study and practice of nonviolent struggle from both the point of view of Jesus and Gandhi, I knew that it could happen again. It could be organized from the grassroots level, just as uh, the Montgomery bus boycott was organized across a three or four year period. So um, eventually I made the decision by the fall of 1958, that if we were gonna have the second major campaign that illustrated the power of the Montgomery bus boycott and the power of nonviolence, I would have to do it and it would have to be done in the city where I lived and worked. And so I consulted my Fellowship of Reconciliation supervisor and said, this is the situation. And so I want you to know that I'm choosing Nashville as a major place to work uh, as an experiment for this job that you I have. And of course, Glenn Smiley and AJ Musty and others quickly said, that's right, do it. So then I went to Kelly Miller Smith, the chair of the Nashville Christian Leadership Council and said, Kelly, if this is going to happen like many of us want, want it to happen, then I said, we have to do it in Nashville. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. We have to do it ourselves. He agreed. We took it immediately that fall to the National Christian Leadership Council, which included C.T. Vivian, incidentally, and Helen Roberts, and uh, Janetta Hayes, included uh, uh, Andrew White, <laughs> and uh, a number of other people. And we said, uh, our first major project shall be uh, creating the second major campaign of nonviolent struggle to demonstrate how it can happen again and how important it is that it happens as a follow-up to the Montgomery bus boycott. That, that board, executive board was unanimous and said, will you be the strategist, Jim Lawson, you be the strategist, the organizer. So. I uh, shortly at the next meeting that fall said that we will begin January 1959 um, uh, to plan how to do it. And then in January 59, I worked out a strategy. Number one, I would use a Gandhian nonviolent approach. It was four points. Uh, focus, that is choose the target and the priority. Uh, negotiation, as we chose the target and got it settled in negotiation, direct action, and then follow up. And that's the basis upon which I did the, uh, the, the, the workshop. See, we said we would have uh, the planning strategy included the tactics we would use, sit-in campaign because 1942, the sit-in was introduced in Los Angeles and especially Chicago, but also Cleveland and Washington, D.C. I learned about that in the 1940s, 1947 and beyond. I read about it. Learned the names of Byron Rustin, who I'd met, Jim Farmer, who I'd met, George Hauser, who I'd met. Uh, so I recognized uh, pretty intuitively that a sit-in was the first tactic we would use. Uh, in the language of nonviolence, a tactic is different from a nonviolent demonstration because a tactic includes more than one method. And I planned from the beginning, we would have sit-in, we would have mass meetings, we would have an economic boycott, whatever, the, other, whatever other kinds of strategies or methods that we used in our full campaign according to what we needed to do. And so uh, then uh, uh, 
January to, to March, we did a laundry list of all the issues plaguing the black community in Nashville. From April to June, we selected out of that laundry list what would be our target. And as I've liked to say, as I've liked to teach and say for many years now, it was the black women in our workshops from January to June, weekly, Saturday morning, uh, that settled my mind about what we were doing because they said we should begin downtown. You preachers, and I said to this, this to the workshop too, uh, you preachers, don't know the horror <laughs> of living in a city that is so segregated. The white colored signs, the lack of the capacity to stop and allow our children to play on the third floor of Harvey the department store. And so the decision was made, we were going to desegregate downtown Nashville. The academics do us great harm when they call it a sit-in campaign instead of a campaign to desegregate because the national model produced almost 200 other cities where what we did in Nashville became the model for what they did in those 200 cities in the southeastern part of the country alone. And the next step of our strategy was to do prep, deep preparation, not light preparation, not training, but preparation. And so we launched the uh, planned workshops, one, two hours a week, beginning in September. And uh, C.T. Vivian and Kelly Smith and others began to announce it from their pulpits and to recruit people. And we sought to recruit students uh, to be a part of it. And uh, so Kelly Miller Smith recruited John Lewis. Uh, I was able to meet Paul LeProd and said to Paul, Paul told, called me back later saying to me, well, uh, this girl at Fisk wants to do something, Diane Nash. I said, well, get her to come to the workshop. Um, I had a brother-in-law who had a good friend at Tennessee State, uh, um, Curtis Murphy. I called Curtis Murphy and said, Curtis, uh, would you like to come for us to do something about this racism in this state? And Curtis, of course, became one of the strong people of our, of our work in that year. And uh, 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 John Lewis recruited Bernard Lafayette. And I don't know who all was recruited by who, but I know that recruitment went forward. C.T. Vivian, of course, was in on it from the beginning as one of our organizers of it. And um, the workshops began in early September and ran through December. Um, in any case, uh, the workshop basically tried to review what I had learned in 10 years from the scriptures, from Jesus, from Gandhi, from my own pra practice of nonviolence, my own time in prison, 13 months in federal prison for civil disobedience. Um, I tried to review some of the spots of nonviolence in Europe, in the United States, in South Africa with Gandhi, in India with the independence movement. We did a um, whole series of uh, exercises for the purpose of getting people to recognize that they could uh, face the massive hostility, the harassment, the bullying, the violence with a, a, a character uh, that many people across the world demonstrate and has been demonstrated in human history for thousands of years, but it's not been taken over except, well, it has been taken over. Some people know this and some groups know it and practice it. So anyway, and that, and that therefore is the uh, basic background uh, from 
um, uh, how the Nashville movement got uh, uh, organized. Uh, I'll repeat, uh, well, I won't, I won't repeat, but, uh, and it was marvelous. Uh, there was no campaign like it. It worked better than I had ever known. I'll never forget the moment on a Saturday morning when we closed down the first workshops to select a target. And I realized that we had made the decision <laughs> under the impact of our women members <laughs> to desegregate downtown Nashville. And I said to myself, good Lord, why did they pick, why did we pick that huge target? No one had selected such a target in the emerging struggles and awakening. So Nashville added the most important strategy of the 20th century movement. And that was the strategy to desegregate, get rid of those horrible signs, open up jobs in the downtown areas of our country, break the back the prohibition for black people to work where they wanted to work, <laughs> where they were qualified to work. Um, um, so that made uh, desegregation as, and public desegregation uh, the second major strategy of the overall movement. NAACP from early 20th century had strategized to do voting registration and to challenge racism in the courts. The Montgomery began the process of looking at downtown segregation, bus, bus segregation in downtown in Montgomery. And then Nashville added that major um, strategy to the movement. And that is one of the historical realities that's rarely talked about. Anyway, that is that should be enough. That's that's the basis. I've I've I've, I've tried to uh, re, you know write these things up, put them down, and uh, in any case, that's the origin. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, very important foundation, so that people have a much deeper appreciation and understanding of the history of the Nashville movement and uh, its origins and its impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, for those of you that would like to learn more about uh, the four steps to a nonviolent uh, campaign that uh, Reverend Lawson indicated, we have a new publication coming out um, uh, in the next few months by UC Press that will uh, uh, elaborate on the four steps to a nonviolent campaign uh, that Reverend Lawson uh, addressed. We are so thrilled today to have uh, with us uh, Professor Angeline Butler, who was one of the uh, participants and leaders of the Nashville movement. And so uh, my first question to you, Professor Butler, is uh, how did you first get involved in this movement? And um, when did you first meet um, Reverend Lawson? Well, how did I get involved? <laughs> a very interesting question. First of all, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little girl at Fisk University at 15 years old, and I became 16 in my freshman year, okay? I was not an early entrant. I had come fresh out of South Carolina cotton fields, okay? And pulling fodder and uh, planting gardens and uh, going to school in Eastover, South Carolina, where both my mother and my father taught. Reverend Isaac Bartley Butler, I love his name because uh, he was quite a wonderful uh, man. I'm adopted to their family at 12 days old. And uh, after me, they had five girls. So there's six Butler girls, okay? <laughs> and, and so Reverend and Mrs. Butler, <laughs> you know, in our school, um, and uh, so we, he's a minister, you know, he's a mathematician, He's the principal of the school. My mother is a second grade teacher and she used to be um, a principal of the school before she married Rem Butler, but then they got married and they, and he became the principal of the school. Okay. So now all of a sudden, as I grew up, you know, uh, in this rural community, little white children played with me every day. 
And I don't think we ever saw really the difference between us. You know, we just were friends. You know, if, if, if someone did something you didn't like, you fight them, right? <laughs> okay, whatever. It was never a problem. But all of a sudden, when we were school age, we went to different schools, different churches, and we disappeared from each other, except after school hours and on weekends when we continued to play with each other until we were high school age and we began to move out. So we often wondered, well, why are they going to that school and we're going to this school? And then our parents had to sit us down and explain what, quote, the institution of segregation was about. And I'm sure it was very difficult for them to explain that or have to explain why we were separate from our old friends, you know, uh, Bonnie and David and, and Jackie, you know, and, and, and why we weren't going to the Richmond County School that was just up the road from where we live, but rather we were bused in high school to the Hopkins High School all the way across about 10 miles away. And uh, so we got through that. And we remained friends. And then we all went off to different colleges. I went to Fisk. I got to Fisk. And all of a sudden, I found myself going to like workshops, not on nonviolence at this point, but going over to faculty members' homes, like on given nights when they would invite us to come and just sort of sit and talk as students with them. We also went to like the International Stu uh, uh, Student Center. And there we saw films about, you know, Africa, Asia, all these things that we didn't know before because we were brought up in the South. They never taught us anything like that. And so we were getting this global experience through the International Student Center. Then the Fusons, Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Nelson Fuson, who was head of the physics department, they were having these Friday night meetings at their home and they were Quakers. And of course they had this whole group, which at that time I didn't realize it, but Mrs. Fuson years later told me she called those the Nashville friends. And at those Nashville friends were our exchange students um, who were white students who had come to Fisk. There were about 15 of them from University of Redlands, from Pomona College, from DePaul University. And that's where I first met Paul LaPrea, over there at Ms. Fuson's house. And at those meetings, we would just informally sit down and have some tea and, and cookies or whatever she was serving that night. And then we'd just talk about the worlds that we had come from. And Frankly, we weren't thinking about anything. We weren't thinking about it leading to anything. We're just getting to know each other. Then the few sons knew about the workshops that were being held down at the First Baptist Church that uh, Reverend Lawson and, and Kelly Miller Smith, C.T. Vivian, Metz Rollins, and all of these people uh, were attending and conducting. And uh, they took us there. And when I listened to Jim Lawson that night, who was a very good looking young man with these glasses on, black glasses on, black rim glasses that, that and this very serious face. And, and when we discovered that he'd been in jail for like 13 months for being a conscientious objector. And frankly, I didn't know pretty much what that was at that point, but my ears were open and, and he spoke with such sincerity, you know, I just was very interested in what he was saying. And then he started talking about his experience at Gandhi, uh, you know, his experience in, in India and uh, his studies. And uh, he'd gone there as a missionary, I believe with the, uh, the AME, Baptist, AME Methodist Church. And um, Somehow, you know, eventually, I didn't know the story at that time. I now know the story that Martin Luther King invited him to come to the South. I know that now, but I didn't know it at that time. What I knew was that this very serious young man was standing in front of me telling us about his life and, and about what he thought was going on. And then, of course, some of the other ministers would talk. And uh, they were talking about racial segregation, uh, uh, how the progress they had made from uh, 1954 because SCLC and the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference was very involved in the desegregation of the Nashville schools. And uh, 
I don't know. I, I, I just was fascinated by this new information in my life. I wasn't labeling myself as anything. I, I, I didn't even know what the word activism meant, okay? And I surely didn't know what communism meant, though I was accused of being a communist <laughs> yeah. later. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> in fact, the Atlanta Constitution eventually listed me number four in the South behind Martin Luther King. You know, I didn't even know what that was, okay? <laughs> anyway, you know, because I was brought up as a Christian and, uh, you know, given the faith of the Bible and, you know, I went through all of those things and I carried that with me to Fisk. So we went to these workshops and then eventually they, you know, we kept going and then they moved up to the Clark Memorial Church from downtown uh, First Baptist Church because they were closer to the campus. You could get more students involved. And now that was Reverend Anderson's church. It was just a couple blocks, you know, from Fisk. And so I went to all the meetings and we would role play. And I was excited, you know, role playing, you know, cause I have an actor's, you know, consciousness, you know, and, you know, these ministers and Mary and Barry and stuff calling me nigga, you know, da -da, you know, and, and, and we're sitting in the front of the chair and they push us off the seats and, and throw us down on the floor. And then after, you know, they harassed everybody now we had a quiet discussion on how we felt being in that position. How did it feel when someone called you that awful name, nigga? You know, how did it feel when someone pushed you off of out of your chair? Okay, or fought you or struggled with you? Well, naturally, I'm from the country, you know, someone you know, push me off. So I'm going to sock it to him. You know what I mean? You know, my first instinct was certainly not nonviolent. It was, I want to beat him up. Okay. And that was the feeling of most of the students that were sitting in those chairs. Yeah. Now, Angela, let me interrupt and ask you a question. What year did you become a freshman at Fisk? 57. 57? Yes, I came, I graduated from high school in, in yeah. June of 57, and I came to Fisk in September. Uh -huh. And what year did, so what year did you go to the Fuson meetings? Okay, uh, from 58. 58, okay. Yeah. Now, the history books have things messed up. Right. Because there's more than one set of workshops. In 58, NCLC, National Christian Leadership Conference, and my boss, uh, Glenn Smiley, had planned before I landed in Nashville in January of 58, uh, workshops that he and I did at the First Baptist Church. There the few sons were going to yeah. those workshops. There was one in March, and there was one, as I recall, in the fall. Right. Okay. Now, many of the books have that those are the workshops that we're talking about. Those are not. Those are not the workshops they we're would, talking they about. Were, they were general workshops right. on pacifism, nonviolence, war and peace, and justice, and racism. And mainly adults were attending those. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And the workshops now we're talking about in relationship to, to the campaign where the workshop These are planned mainly, as yeah. a part of the preparation for the campaign. Exactly, and that's 59. That's right. These were September, uh, February 60 and whatnot. So yes. largely January, uh, uh, September to December before Christmas. Absolutely, in 1959. 1959, then we picked Yeah, so I'm going to the workshops. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm learning all of these things about nonviolence. I'm hearing about, you know, Gandhi and uh, Jim is talking about Thoreau. And then of course they're talking about Jesus Christ. Now I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't know who Thoreau was and I didn't know who Gandhi was, okay? My first and I want to interrupt you. <laughs> I never said Jesus Christ. Yeah, I know, but C.T. Vivian did. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I never said Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> C.T. Vivian. Yeah, because by that time I and Bess Rollins. That the I'm sorry. Teachings of, the teachings of Jesus were covered up by the dogma 
and the belief systems and the salvation systems in Christianity. And I was already a critic of that as a pastor. Okay. <laughs> but you had other ministers with you, like Metz oh, Rollins. Yeah. Yes. That's and right. you had you had yeah. Kelly Miller Smith and you had you had C. T. Vivian. And I think Fred Shuttlesworth was there sometimes too. You know, no, back and not forth. Really. Uh, maybe but that's where I met him. I met him at the workshops in Nashville. I didn't meet him any other place. Uh -huh. I didn't meet, I did not six, meet. You may have met him in 58 then. Um, I, I might have because I was around the few sons a long time, but so if I met, met him in 58, if he came up to those workshops, because yeah, I may have, I may have gone down the first Baptist church with the few sons to one of those workshops, because that's who took me to the workshops in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's where like my to, interest uh, began. I'd like to focus on the, uh, so, you know, for a full year, there were all of these workshops, preparation, dialogue right. uh, with uh, uh, student and community leaders uh, to uh, set the foundation and the preparation for the campaign to desegregate downtown Nashville. Um, so could we move forward to talk about the actual uh, act of civil disobedience? You know, Reverend Lawson talked about the four steps, the focus, the negotiation, and then the direct action. So let's talk about um, what it was like to actually uh, participate in the uh, sit-in campaign. So, um, Professor, Professor Butler, can you share your reflections well, on those actions? You got. You got to remember, we'd gone to the workshops, and we'd also during those fifty-nine workshops, we tested in very small groups downtown lunch counters, but we elected not to get arrested, and that's before Christmas. But now it's after Christmas, we've gone home for the vacation, come back, and now we're excited about going back to these workshops again, you know, because these workshops are kind of fun. We don't know what direction they're gonna take, okay? I'm not thinking I'm going to go sit down and be arrested. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking I'm going to the workshops. I'm learning of the art of nonviolence, okay? So, and passive resistance. So all of a sudden, Greensboro happened in February 1. And these young men got a lot of national attention, these four young men. And we decided in Nashville that was a, a wonderful thing because they really didn't have a movement in Greensboro. They hadn't really been in training, but they sparked national attention. And so now we decided to make sure that that idea didn't die. And so on the February 13th, we had a massive sit-in in Nashville and we canvassed all of the different campuses, uh, the Tennessee State, a &I University, we canvassed um, Fisk University, Meharry Medical School, as well as um, American Baptist Theological Seminary, meaning the students on each one of those campuses who were from the workshop they're the ones that recruited other students from each of their own campuses, okay? I remember we used to stay up all night long talking students in going downtown, okay? And the first one that we had, you know, it was a massive turnout. I don't know what the numbers were. Do you remember, Jim? About 250 people. Yeah, or more. But, but that was met, uh, we actually met on a Thursday on Fisk campus, about 75 of us. Okay. Determined that we would we would be downtown on the 13th. Okay. Yeah. That was the first sit-in we actually did in that campaign. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then we did another one. And, and on that first one, we were heckled downtown. Um, no one was really beaten up or anything. That's right. Um, but um, you know they would yell things at us, much like uh, they were doing in the workshops we had in '59. Um, and when they uh, refused us and and told us they were going to arrest us if they if, if we didn't leave, we left. Okay. And uh, then on the the 20th, which was the following Saturday, we again had a massive turnout. Uh, students were very excited about these sit-ins, and then um, we again left, you know, rather than elect to be arrested. But then on the third one, 
that morning, and I, I specifically remember this because the night before, I don't know when the chief of police or whoever called Jim and, uh, and, and, and Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, they told us if we came downtown that next morning, we would be arrested. So we all met at the church very early in the morning because we had to really discuss this thing, you know, and figure out what we're going to do because we hadn't really thought about being arrested and going to jail. That discussion hadn't really come up in the nonviolent workshops, okay? <laughs> and so this morning, there are like 15 of us on the central committee, all students. And uh, that's Curtis Murphy, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 Jerry Hearn, uh, uh, I, I can name all of them, you know, uh, Peggy Alexander, Eleanor uh, Jones, you know, we're all there. And we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do if we are in fact gonna go downtown that morning. And we must have been discussing that for, you know, way over an hour or so. And we couldn't make a decision. And for the first time, that group had to take a vote. And as I remember, it was seven that wanted to go downtown. There were like six that said no. And then there were one, uh, there was one abstention. So maybe there were 13 of us that particular morning on the central committee. So we decided to just take our decision upstairs and we were expecting, you know, a whole bunch of students just like they've been for the first two demonstrations. But on this morning, there were only about 40 students upstairs. <laughs> okay, everybody stayed home. And so we had to explain to them that we would be arrested if we went downtown that day and it might have you know, uh, we don't know what would happen because we hadn't really, you know, there's no way you can plan on what's gonna happen if you get arrested in the Southern jail. Uh, you also don't know what's gonna happen to your parents who are living in Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and all over the place, because we have a very active KKK in the South. And all I have to do is make a phone call that say, burn down Bevel's family's house burned on Lafayette's family house. These little children are getting up and let's show them who's boss, you know, and that's the way, you know, people were talking to each other. Well, they, we, we had to deal with the reality of that. And we also might be expelled from school. We didn't know how Fisk was gonna feel about it. We didn't know how Tennessee State was gonna feel about it, Meharry or uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary for that. Fact. But once we explained it to the students, what might happen, one by one, they lifted their hand to go downtown that morning. And I remember that was the most moving moment I think I've ever had in the movement was when they elected to do something different. And we told them what Bevel had said to us that morning, because he was, for my money, the stronger one in our group. He said, we got up with the roosters this morning to come down to the First Baptist Church. We knew that this was the morning. You see, Black folks have always been trying to figure out what's going to happen before it happens. He says, that's why you can't get nothing done. He says, why don't we, for one time in our lives, change that thing? Let's turn it around. Let's let the house burn down and then see what happens. And that was when we took the vote and we took that vote upstairs to the students and they followed us downtown that morning. We left Bevel at the church, Lafayette and Diane were gonna be outside people running around from different places, checking on everybody to see what was happening. And we left in very small groups of like six and seven. And we went to McClellan's five and 10, Woolworth five and 10. Uh, the pharmacy that was across the street from there, it wasn't called Walgreens at then, <laughs> okay. And we went to um, Sloan and Kane uh, department stores. And the rest is history. They, 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 the people heckled us in McClellan's, that was my group that morning where Paula Pratt was pulled off of the stool and beaten. 
he was the first student who was white or black even, but he was white and they picked on him cause he was white and cause he was with there with us black students sitting at that counter. They pulled him off of the stool and, and they beat him, two young white men. And so the police eventually came in and they arrested, the, uh, they, they pulled, they arrested Paul and they also took in their custody those two young white men that uh, beat him up, but I don't think they put him in the same, uh, uh, I'm sure they didn't put him in the same paddy wagon, okay? <laughs> and um, when we were outside, they made us get off of the stools. And when we were outside of the McClellans, I realized they weren't arresting us. And they apparently had roped off the counters on the inside while we were outside. And I pulled Lafayette, who was supposed to be running from store to store, I pulled him back into there. I said, man, they're not arresting us. So we pulled everybody back in the store and we went and we stepped across the ropes and sat down at the counters and now they arrested us. And that was my group that morning. We were the first arrest of uh, roughly the Tennesseans say 80 students, but actually there were more students than that because you know, after that first arrest and uh, the time that we served in jail, which was really for, it was just a few days for most of us. John Lewis stayed longer than us. He refused totally to get out of jail. So I think he was over there around two weeks. And, but our lawyers, Z. Alexander Luby and the team of lawyers, they wanted us to come out of jail because they wanted to appeal that decision. And we weren't back at the dormitory for more than a week and a half. And they issued another summons for our rearrest. And nobody talks about this, but in March, just shortly after February 27th, we now were arrested on a graver charge, conspiracy to obstruct trade and commerce. And we had to turn ourselves in to the police. And Mrs. Fuson often talks about how she was driving Diane Nash around for about two hours that day because Diane really didn't want to go to jail. And she had to kind of let her relax so she could turn herself in. And Diane told me later that when everybody was counted who turned themselves in, instead of 80 people, there were about 106 students that had been arrested that day. And um, because what happened was uh, you had 40 something in the morning plus the, the, the four, 13 or 15 central committee members. But then once we were arrested and they heard about it back at the schools, you know, the students from Tennessee and I, they, they rushed down to the church and, and uh, some fifth students and some uh, Harry students, and then they were sitting in every place that they could find. And uh, they arrested us until they didn't have any more room in the jail. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so uh, what was interesting about it is that once we were in jail, it was like old home week because <laughs> we're all friends and we knew why we were there. You know, a lot of times people talk about the music from the civil rights movement. Can I tell you something? We weren't singing. That's right. We were so busy taking care of business. <laughs> we had no time to sing, right. except once we were in jail and we're sitting there with each other, we sang, made up songs, a whole number, but we weren't singing at those meetings. Yeah. I wish we had uh, uh, another hour to uh, delve into <laughs> these uh, extraordinary stories. Uh, it was so uh, wonderful to hear uh, Reverend Lawson providing the foundation about hearing about why Nashville and the preparation and the months and months of workshops that led up to this. It was so wonderful, Professor Butler, to hear your account of a first person view of the courageous decision that young people made to get arrested, to challenge Jim Crow, to challenge segregation in spite of everything you knew about what might happen. 
and then uh, to vote on that decision to uh, go to jail. Uh, it's, it's just so uh, inspiring to hear um, both of you uh, recount uh, those uh, uh, stories. Um, I did want to, uh, uh, in you know, wrapping up, really talk about reflecting on the impact of the Nashville campaign and how it truly um, was replicated, was, uh, was uh, exported, was uh, the source of inspiration for so many other campaigns throughout the South. And um, Reverend Lawson, could you, could you reflect on that in terms of how, what the impact of Nashville was hmm. in growing the movement? Uh, I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. Uh, it was Martin King's visit to Nashville in which he called the Nashville campaign a model movement. And uh, other observers were that the Nashville campaign was the most disciplined movement in the sit-in campaigns um, in the year 1960. Um, the, the first major result is that May 10th to our negotiating committee the merchants had agreed that on May 10th, the first black people would be served in their restaurants and those who were participating in it and all. Uh, we prepared couples to go in on the 10th. They pulled down the signs and began the renovation of restrooms and whatnot and whatnot, prepared their people to see black people at the counter. And then, so May 10th, and before the end of that year, more than 110 or 25 cities had gone through the same process, most of them using the Nashville plan to do it. I now know that it was not just 125 cities, but within the next year to two years, uh, more than 200 cities in the southeastern part of the country uh, and this, uh, this number comes from the work of Professor Sekou Franklin of Middle State, uh, Tennessee, uh, Middle State uh, University, where he teaches political science. And he's continuing to do research on the campaign, on that effort. More than 200 cities in the Southeast had abolished their white colored signs, no wetback signs and had uh, begun to desegregate uh, uh, and, and uh, this desegregation also then later on included uh, white uh, workers in the store, black workers in the stores who were clerks and floor walkers and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot in downtown Nashville. So um, and that's it. Then the third thing I would list is that, uh, and this is something I did not know at the time, but we prepared um, a major portion of the leadership for the next decade in the struggle. The organization of SNCC uh, had, was done with major impact from our national campaign. I was contrary to the books, uh, the SNCC development and conference was planned by Ella Baker Martin Luther King Jr. and Jim Lawson. We organized it, recruited people for it. And SCLC put up the initial cost, uh, the first monies to help make it happen. Uh, that's, how, that's how that conference in uh, Shaw University happened. It's astonishing to me that so many books uh, don't know that story. <laughs> at all because a lot of misinformation but uh, we provided a, a major leadership through SNCC through SCLC through the NAACP American Friends Service Committee in some parts of the country Bernard Lafayette became a uh, secretary for the um, Friends Service Committee in Chicago <laughs> as an example so we prepared the leadership that became the staff and the volunteer organizers in Mississippi and elsewhere. 
uh, and then laid the foundation for the Freedom Ride. The Freedom Ride in its second stage could not have happened if Nashville had not happened. We were the only group in the country that had had the kind of deep preparation on the power of nonviolent struggle. <laughs> so that when the KKK and the White Citizens Council uh, burned the buses and mobbed the buses in Birmingham, in Alabama, uh, our Nashville people spontaneously, uh, it was not a handful of people, it was most of the activists in our campaign in Nashville who recognized we could not allow a burning bus to stop the emergence of our movement. And that was almost unanimous. The books don't understand that at all, but it was a national group said, well, we're not dropping the Freedom Ride. John Lewis was already on it, had been badly beaten yeah. in, in uh, uh, Montgomery. Um, and so our, because of our movement, we said, we will not let the spiritual forces of wickedness stop our movement. And so the Nashville took it up and we began to send volunteers the very first night, um, the second night and the third night and then more than 400 people then eventually spent time in parchment prison in uh, Mississippi. So that was, that was another big effect. And then uh, the last one I will mention is that we turned parchment prison into a university on nonviolence. And our Nashville people told the story of Nashville campaign. <laughs> and one of the people of Nashville, Cornell um, Regan, went to Albany, Georgia. And uh, Charles Sherrod, who was in prison in the Freedom Ride, went to Albany, Georgia. And so 1962 was the Albany, Georgia campaign <laughs> that, that moved to follow Nashville almost to a letter to desegregate downtown Albany, Georgia. Uh, they did not immediately exceed, but they did succeed. It was called a failure in the press, but that's because the press didn't know how to view these, this rather unconventional social movement. Uh, they, did not, they did not fail. Number one, they had, um, I think, several hundred people in jails. Number two, the white merchants knew and the police knew that segregation was dead in Albany, Georgia. <laughs> it didn't immediately happen, but the white power structure recognized that segregation was gone. And the third great thing that happened in that movement was the black community lost their fear of seg segregation authority. And uh, even the police uh, understood that, that their, their authority was gone to govern segregation. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Lawson, to capture the powerful legacy of the Nashville campaign, how not only did it bring forth a new generation of leaders who seeded the movement, but indeed in more than 200 cities throughout the South, hmm. the Nashville model was embraced and spread and helped to build this movement. Uh, I'm gonna give the last word to you, uh, Professor Butler. Um, you know, you, you talked about how uh, this movement transformed individuals. You, you talk about the, 15 members of the Central Committee as if it was last week. You can still remember yes. their names. Yeah, uh, we, we're but, still but, in but, touch but, with each other. Those <laughs> of us who are alive, we're still in touch. That's wonderful. <laughs> but but just to, to, if you could reflect on the transformation on the personal level, on how movements change people's lives. If you could uh, reflect on that and then we'll give you the last word. Well, you know, first of all, you know, we were students and like when we went to the SNCC meetings and stuff, we didn't have any money, you know, like we're on $5 a week allowances and stuff like that, okay? And we put our monies together to like get down there. I remember uh, going to the SNCC meeting in Georgia in Marianne Morgan's car. She was from 
Uh, she had a little Fiat and how we packed in there like sausages and drove from Nashville down to Georgia, okay? And uh, once we were down at the SNCC meeting, and I remember that Julian Bond, for instance, invited us to his house and we had a backyard party. And it was a cookout and a whole number. And so we, that gave us a chance to get to know the Georgian people, okay? Uh, because Julian was leading the movement down there. And um, then, you know, we, uh, Peggy Trotta, for instance, who is right here with us today, she uh, was one of the students that I invited from uh, New York to go with me to Crisfield, Maryland. She and her brother and uh, Faye, um, uh, uh, well, I can't think of everybody's names right now. I'd have to write them out. But, you know, and, and, and Peggy, uh, took it so seriously in 61 that she ended up in Albany, Georgia, where Jim is just talking about. And she worked in Albany, Georgia. And I have to say that in Albany, Georgia, one other thing happened too. Martin Luther King went down there and he heard Prathia Hall speak and she talked about, I have a dream. And Prathia Hall was our, one of our SNCC people. And Martin Luther King asked her permission to use her theme at the March on Washington. Most people don't know that that's where he got the I had a dream speech idea from, was one of the women in SNCC. You know, we bonded, you know, when we went to these meetings and stuff, we didn't have any money. We, we, we went, we slept in people's houses, 15 across the room, you know, throw blankets across. <laughs> and I often asked Diane, I said, well, what do we do? you know, for bathrooms and stuff. You know, we had so many people staying at one house. She says, I don't know, we managed, you know. <laughs> but that's the way it was. We were with each other all the time. And once we bonded, there was no breaking up even years later. You know, uh, I mean, when Lafayette would come to New York, he called me up and he called his wife and he says, Angeline's with me tonight. And we talk all night about this movement, what's going on. I mean, we bonded with brothers and sisters, friends. I hope I answered your question. We still are. I just talked to Curtis, uh, Curtis Murphy uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, yeah, he called me yesterday, okay? We still call each other. You know, Frederick uh, Lennard who went on the Freedom Rides, you know, and, and William Harbor, you know, who was badly beaten in Montgomery. He just recently died. Kwame Lillard, you know, we were friends until he died. You see that, that, that poster on my wall of the Freedom Rides? Kwame Lillard sent me that just about two months before he died, okay? He used to send me stuff all the time out of Nashville. That's how close we were. King Holland and I often on the telephone. We still are, you know, we just are. And, and there's a bond between us that never breaks. Thank you so much, Professor Butler, and for lifting up the memory and the legacy of the Freedom Rides. This is the 60th anniversary of the uh, uh, 1961 Freedom Rides. And so uh, it's amazing that 60 years later, those bonds are uh, as strong as ever and the impact has truly been historic. So I wanted to thank uh, you for joining us. Professor Butler, it's yes. been uh, wonderful Thanks, to have Elena. you. Good to see you always. <laughs> oh, I'll see yeah. you in California. Yeah. I got my good. I got my shots. Okay, good. <laughs> so maybe I can travel a little bit. Good. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. And uh, so join us next week. Our guest speaker will be uh, Dolores Huerta, one of the founders of the United Farm Workers of America. Please join us again for nonviolence and social movements next Wednesday. Thank you, Jim. Again. Thank you, Kent. Be good, Thank Angeline. You.